Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Monica Kelly, and I'm happy to be here today presenting in one of my favorite specialties, obstetrical ultrasound. It's an area I've thoroughly enjoyed working and expanding my knowledge in for the last 20 years or so. And while this presentation was originally targeted towards sonographers and scanners looking to increase their exposure in the MFM specialty, I hope everyone can gain some useful information regardless of their differing amounts of experience in obstetrical imaging. I have no conflicts to disclose. And today I'll be discussing the ultrasound assessment of fetal biometry and growth and why biometry matters. And while I know it's one of the more basic assessments we perform in an obstetrical exam, I'm going to cover why accuracy and technique are so important. So I'll be covering why, again, the standardized and accurate biometry is important in every ultrasound that we perform. I'll review the appropriate landmarks and techniques for accurate measurements of crown rump, BPD, head circumference, AC, and femur length. I'll understand how our measurements are applied for the determination of gestational age, growth, and size. And we'll review the assessment of fetal biometry when diagnosing fetal growth disorders. So why is good quality and accurate biometry important? Well, we use ultrasound as this important diagnostic tool in the diagnosis of fetal growth disorders. And these different growth disorders are associated with a variety of adverse maternal and perinatal outcomes. Mm -hmm. So this makes ultrasound a key screening tool for these growth disorders and in delivering proper management that are essential components in providing antenatal care. I'll be referring to the SOA guidelines throughout this talk, and I'll just run through a few of the highlights from their guidelines here. So fetal biometry is performed to assess for fetal growth restrictions associated with SGA or LGA, and it specifies that operators should have specialized training in obstetrical imaging and safety complying with ALARA, and clear images must be produced with sufficient magnification, proper depiction of landmarks, and proper caliper placement. It's also important to perform that regular quality control at your site on a consistent and regular um, review of images so that we can maintain that consistency and um, accuracy amongst operators. So here I've included some of the more common histories that we'll see in patients that are referred for an obstetrical scan. So we'll see things like query SGA, LGA, uh, different types of multiple pregnancies for serial growth assessments, different genetic disorders and syndromes, different maternal conditions such as uh, gestational or essential hypertension, preeclampsia, placental insufficiency, diabetes, renal or heart disease, anemia, malnutrition, substance abuse, just to name a few, and teratogenic exposures. Um, so as you can see, there are quite a few scenarios where we'll be required to perform these growth assessments. So first off, I just wanted to discuss the assessment of fetal size and growth and that there is a difference between the two. So to determine fetal size or an estimated fetal weight at one point in time, you first need to start with an accurate first trimester dating scan and you'll need access to accurate growth charts. And then you'll determine the estimated fetal weight by performing accurate biometry and plot the percentiles and measures of deviation from the mean at a point in time. For example, as you can see on this growth curve here on the right, there's only one plotted measurement and at that moment in time, the fetus sits roughly on that 30th percentile based on an accurate dating scan. So you can't assess whether there's been appropriate fetal growth without performing another set of measurements or having a previous set of biometry measurements to compare with. On the other hand, fetal growth is a dynamic process and it requires at least two sets of accurate biometry measurements separated by time. So the ISOAC recommends ideally a three week interval, but no less than one. And again, you need access to accurate growth charts for plotting and assessing any change in growth rate and or percentiles. And if you observe any larger increase or decrease in growth velocity, it's important to note this would be most critical in cases of a sudden deceleration in growth where a referral to an MFM facility for possible Doppler assessment, follow-up growth scans, and closer monitoring would be indicated. So here I've included the chart we currently use in our region and facility for calculating percentiles according to gestational age and gender. I understand it's under the process of review as I speak, but it will be used until we have a replacement um, in place. We also use the Astrea program for plotting different growth and biometry and, and generating our reports. And they can also be modified to different growth charts and formulas such as Chitty versus Hadlock 
But the bottom line is that we just need to be consistent across all centers and regionally for accurate assessments and comparisons with one another. Um, so for this particular chart here on the left, our Alberta live birth weight chart, um, we round down for gestational age under the gender specific growth percentile. And you should be referring to growth charts with every set of biometry and growth assessment performed in order to assess any significant changes that warrant closer follow up or referral for Dopplers. And it's also important to note and plot individual biometry measurements, as you can see here on the charts on the right, as any major changes individually can also trigger further evaluations. So I wanted to quickly review the terms used for different growth classifications. So an HE fetus is an estimated fetal weight between the 10th and 90th percentiles, as you can see in that bottom right chart. Um, an LGA fetus is an estimated fetal weight or AC above the 90th percentile. And an SGA fetus is an estimated fetal weight or AC below the 10th percentile. And this includes constitutionally small babies with normal Dopplers, biophysical parameters, as demonstrated in that upper right graph. I didn't include IEGR in, in the slide or in my presentation today, as I don't have quite the time to cover it in the depth that it requires, but it's important when biometry measurements are plotting much less than anticipated, less than that 10th percentile or having larger decelerations of two quartiles growth velocity that they are referred to an MFM center for reassessment. Um, this will include confirmation of that size and growth and possible Doppler assessment studies. Um, that being said, I just want to direct you to those two growth charts on that far left. And while the upper graph demonstrates a fetus with a deceleration of two quartiles approaching that SGA ter territory at about that 10th percentile and would warrant to follow up um, growth or referral for Dopplers, the lower left graph would also warrant the same follow up and or referral as it displays the same two quartile drop, regardless of, of pl still plotting AGA. So coming back around to our ability to assess fetal size and growth, we need to know there's been accurate dating of the pregnancy. It's an abs absolute prerequisite for assessing the fetal size and growth. And I'll just run through these quickly here. So accurate dating is done between seven and 14 weeks with a good quality crown rump length measurement, and I'll get to that. Um, the crown rump needs to measure 10 millimeters or greater. If it's measuring over 84 millimeters, the head biometry with or without femur length can be used from mid trimester and subsequent scans should not be used to recalculate the gestational age. So because this accurate dating is so important in the assessment of fetal size and growth, I've included a couple examples of dating scans here. And while that image on the left is okay, it could be better. It's important just to make sure that the edges are well seen and the yolk sac or any other structure is not incorporated into that crown rump length measurement. And while you can see the image here on the right is in a nice mid sagittal plane with anatomy and crown rump clearly visualized for a very accurate measurement, this can be better achieved with possibly an EV scan, tweaking the machine settings, using your dynamic range, precision, focal zone, zoom, decreasing sector width, all those things that we can manipulate on our machines to increase our resolution. So onto the uh, dating during the first trimester scan, and I know Michelle's covered a little bit of this in her talk also, but I just wanted to reiterate as it's just a very important start. And I wanted to touch on what we want to strive for during this scan, but first I'll go through a few examples of what's not acceptable or will lead to inaccuracies in our dating. So the image here on the left is not in a true mid-sagittal plane, so you can't tell if there's any flexion or extension from this angle. Um, while the image here on the right is in that mid-sagittal plane, the fetus is in too much of a curled and flexed position, leading to an under-measurement of your crown rump. While this image here on the left shows a fetus in an overly extended position, obviously leading to that over-measurement of your crown rump. And while the image here on the right is in a beautiful uh, mid-sagittal plane, neutral head and neck position, we still need to be very careful with the caliper placement with that yellow dotted line depicting an appropriate measurement plane. So again, I just wanted to reiterate what we want to strive for here. Mid-sagittal plane, neutral head and neck position, and proper caliper placements. 
So now that we hopefully have our accurate dating, I'll move on to the biometry content. And I'm going to cover proper positioning and landmarks for all the biometry measurements we do after 14 weeks. So I'll be covering the BPD, the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and femur length. The humerus length will fall under all the same principles I'll cover under my femur length. We use all these measurements to calculate the estimated fetal weight. So starting with our BPD measurement here, you can see all the three main planes that we use to assess cranial anatomy. Um, the top plane here, A, is our transventricular plane. And for obvious reasons, we use this to assess the ventricles nicely along with our CSP and symmetry. Well, the bottom one here is our transcerebellar plane and you can see the corresponding angle. We use this to interrogate our posterior fossa. But what we're looking for for our BPD measurement is right here in the middle, plane B, our transthalamic plane. And I'll get into the more specifics of our uh, landmarks and positioning in, in my next slide, but you can see the corresponding levels in that image. And I think we've all seen that before. Um, so again, I know that we all know our landmarks, gonna, but I'm going to run through them again here. So we're in our transthalamic plane. That's what we're looking for. We want nice symmetry. Um, we want to be at the level of the third ventricle and thalamus. We want to obviously see our cavum septi pellucidum, the tentorial hiatus visible posteriorly. We do not want to see our cerebellum. You want a nice, smooth and symmetric cavalarium. And this is really important that the head is occupying more than half of the total image, just as you see in these examples here to the right. Um, you want your caliper and ellipse to be placed correctly. So with our BPD, it's that leading edge to leading edge of the bone. And for the head circumference, just encircling the uh, bone, not including any of the skin. Um, I also wanted to note that while visualizing and including that CSP uh, in our measurements, especially in our second trimester detail scan, it's also acceptable to perform some of our measurements with that fornix, especially in the third trimester, just to maintain that proper shape and borders of the cavalaria. Um, pr again, providing that CSP has been visualized and documented separately. So we receive a lot of referrals for follow-up growth concerning SGA and IUGR fetuses in our facility. And we frequently assess prior outside imaging for accuracy. And we've noted many different variations leading to some inaccuracy in calculations. So I just wanted to include some of those examples um, that we sometimes come across. Um, so those include um, not having all the landmarks present that we need. Um, caliper and ellipse placement just slightly off, um, the plane and symmetry, and a big one is magnification. This is the most common one that we see. If you're not magnifying your image enough, it's very difficult to see your landmarks, and this can lead to inaccuracy in caliper placements and inaccuracies in your overall measurements. So I just wanted to include some of those. I also wanted to include some suggestions when coming across a more difficult position or an uncooperative baby, like that head facing straight up or down or the head very deep in the pelvis. And while all these seem very basic and easy, they usually work. And the main thing is just taking the time for maintaining the accuracy, take the opportunities when they present and use different techniques to manipulate what you need. I've sometimes resorted to an ED for very low lying heads or other body parts. Um, and so I just wanna run through them. So move your patient, turn them onto their left or right sides and back, um, lower the patient's head. I, I do in my facility have the um, luxury of being able to go even into, further into a Trendelenburg position to get that head floating up out of the pelvis, move on come back. You have at least 20 minutes to scan and it, likely the baby's going to change positions in that time. Just be opportunistic and really changing your angle of incination, especially in these ones that are facing straight up or down, just drastically coming around to the side. Um, just like in this example, this is the same baby um, getting that bulks perpendicular or horizontal so that you can get your BPD measurement perpendicular to it. But at the very minimum, 
Achieving that oval shaped head with symmetry and as many landmarks as possible is so important. I always make note on my images or my tech report that the measurement was difficult and or possibly inaccurate. So a note can be made. They can sometimes take the head measurements out of the biometry measurements um, if it will lead to inaccuracies in the estimated fetal weight. So it's really important to note. So moving on to our abdominal circumference. And this diagram here depicts the three different levels of the abdomen and their corresponding ultrasounds, as you'll see. And I've seen them all in biometry measurements. So level A is too low in the abdomen, and it's always going to lead to a smaller AC measurement. Level C is probably the most common one I see, and it's that oblique angle through the abdomen, and it will always lead to an over measurement. So what we're looking for is level B, a nice uh, right at the um, midline there and coming in through that lateral aspect. And you can see that uh, curvature of that umbilical vein entering the liver. That's, that's where we're going to achieve our most accurate AC measurement. And again, I know we all know these and I'm just gonna run through them quickly. So we're looking for a nice circular transverse plane at the level of the fetal liver. Uh, curse short section of that intrahepatic umbilical vein entering the liver. You want to see your stomach bubble, the three points of the spine, and a, a big key is that descending or aorta is, is very circular. Um, short unbroken ribs, we do not want to see any kidneys or lungs in our measurement. And again, very important that the image occupies more than half of the total image, as you can see in this example here on the right. You want your calipers and ellipse placed correctly with it um, encompassing the skin and take at least three measurements. And those three measurements should be fairly um, similar to one another. If they're really drastically different, you're probably over measuring. Um, I, I do take at least three measurements, sometimes more depending on position and accuracy. Um, and depending on your facility, um, some take an average of those measurements and some will prefer to use the most accurate and best positioned um, and most accurately measured one, which is what we uh, tend to do in our facility. And again, I've included some more common variations that we come across in our AC measurements. And these again, include our plane, positioning and symmetry, ellipse placement, landmarks, and again, the big one, magnification. But I think the most common one that I come across is that uh, top left one in that oblique plane. If you're seeing too much of that umbilical vein, um, if it's too close to that anterior surface of the abdomen, it's going to be uh, over measured and cause a, a larger measurement than it truly is. Um, I also wanted to include some of the tips and tricks for um, abdominal circumferences, and we often come across this one, especially in a PPROM or low AFI or very compact maternal abdomens, that little indent here. Um, while it's very simple, basic, and easy, works greater than 90% of the time, roll your patient onto their side, ensure there's no fetal breathing, and that indent comes right out. You, you'll be able to place your lips more accurately um, and see all of our borders clearly for more accurate measurements. We also come across this one when the baby's facing straight down or even up. Um, that one's including the kidneys there. Um, it'll always lead, this one will typically lead to a under measurement of your AC. So again, we just wanna roll our patients, drastically change your angle of insonation. You wanna come in through that lateral aspect of the abdomen. You can see all the borders much clearer and, and where you want your lips placed. And again, move on, come back if the baby's not in a good position. Um, and our oblique positioning here. Um, I, I tend to find this is typically more challenging for newer or learner scanners, but nevertheless important. Um, 
just make sure that you're at the angle of the fetus in the uterus. They lie at that angle or oblique in the maternal abdomen. So we just need to position the probe at that same oblique angle. So move your transducer either up or down, caudal or cephalic on the baby and angle your probe up or down accordingly. We don't want any kidneys or lung in our measurement. So again, this is the same baby and, and just see how clearly you can see the edges and where to place your lips. So onto femur length finally here. So simple, but I see so many variations in this measurement. Um, and I have a few slides depicting what and where we need to measure for accuracy here. Um, so first off, we just need to make sure that we're only measuring the ossified portions of the diaphysis and metaphysis as you see labeled there D and M. Um, and I'll get into the next one here. So we also want to measure only the mainly the external portion of our femurs. And I know this is common practice, but measuring that internal portion will give you a more curved appearance and typically a shorter measurement. Um, but I just wanna note that it's good practice to measure both limbs in a detailed exam to ensure one is not much shorter than the other because that can happen. Um, but that would be the only time that I measure that dependent limb. So here I've included all the requirements and landmarks for our uh, femur measurements. And again, I know that we know these. Um, so we want that alignment to the long axis of the femur. So both ends of the bone clearly visible. And I wanna stress blunt edges, um, less than a 45 degree angle to horizontal, ideally between that zero to 15 degrees. But I'm gonna argue here that greater than, again, 90% of the time we can get that femur completely horizontal. And also again, um, the femur occupying more than half of that total image. So just stressing your magnification. Um, and again, just putting your focal zone right up to that femur so we can demarcate those edges more clearly and calipers placed correctly. And I'm gonna cover that in my next slide here, the do's and don'ts. So I just wanna stress that you don't want any um, angled portions of your femur, the greater trochanter or ossifications to be included. So you can see the check marks here. Um, again, some variations that I commonly see, um, and I'm gonna hammer this one home because I'm a bit OCD about this one. Um, so positioning and plane. Um, so even though this angle falls into our acceptable range, we can do better than this. Always aim to get it, again, fully horizontal. It'll always be more accurate. Um, our caliper placements. Don't incorporate those angled edges. Um, include that greater trochanter like you see here in this measurement. Again, it will lead to over measuring. And finally, magnification. If you're not magnifying your image enough, you won't be able to see your edges clearly enough. And it will, again, lead to an over measurement. So as you can see a theme here, we do get a lot of over-measured femurs. This will really stand out when we're performing serial growth measurements. We don't want to get into the habit of falsely elongating the femurs to fit cutoffs of normal or match previous over-measured limbs, as that will continue through each growth scan and impact the accuracy of our estimated fetal weight calculations. So again, just to reiterate here, um, this femur was taken without magnification, proper magnification, or being completely horizontal. So just taking the extra time uh, to magnify, get it horizontal, I just wanted to um, point out the difference in the measurements here. So 66.4 uh, versus 62.2. That's a significant difference that that makes. Um, again, what difference does an improperly measured AC really make? So the next three measurements are all of the same baby. Um, this image here on the left was taken at that oblique angle, um, leading to an over measurement, as I uh, showed earlier. And so that, that measurement plotted out at around that 90th percentile at 259. While measuring from the back of the baby, as I specified earlier, it leads to often an under measurement um, and it measured 228 and was plotting in and around that 20 to 30th percentile. Again, that's, that's significantly different from one another. 
um, when in actuality, um, measured in that required plane through the lateral aspect of the abdomen, this baby actually was plotting in and around that 60th percentile at 243. And again, just a couple more examples here. Um, take this BPD measurement and how that lack of magnification and conversely not seeing and demonstrating landmarks adequately will lead to a difference in your measurement here. So we have that 72 versus 68 millimeters. And same principle here with, with the femur and lack of uh, magnification in that angled plane, making it difficult to properly demarcate those edges and borders and clearly and sharply um, see those, those edges. And it leads to an over measurement of the femur. Um, once again, as you can see, 56 versus 54 millimeters. So small errors in positioning or measurements of each area can lead to a big difference in the estimated fetal weight. So the two following slides are of the same patient. And if you look closely at the positioning and measurements here, they don't look that bad, right? Um, but if you, if you do take an even closer look here, the calipers on our head measurements are just slightly off and the AC is slightly oblique with a little bit of lung present and a little bit of a generous ellipse. And while that femur isn't um, too off of horizontal, we've included the oblique tips in our measurement. Um, so this baby uh, weighed 1700, and, uh, 1,700 grams when you put all those measurements together. So same baby, just a little extra tweaking um, and increased detail to our caliper placement, the same baby measured at 1,395 grams. Again, that's a significant difference. And this is how both sets of measurements plotted on our graphs. The first set of measurements led to the fetus that appeared to be plotting query LGA on and around that 96th percentile. And this would lead to unnecessary follow-up or maternal stress like, uh, and extra uh, diabetic screening. But with the ac more accurate measurement techniques, the fetus actually measured on that 50th percentile and plotted AGA with likely no follow-up required, depending on history, of course. Um, and this equals much less maternal stress and decreased resources needed for any unnecessary follow-ups. Um, so the next series of slides are from a case of Dai Dai twins that I came across that were being followed with serial growth scans as per protocol. Um, they're being followed at two-week intervals, and although they're considered a less complicated twin type, following and measuring growth accurately is still very important. And because we perform measurements at frequent intervals in multiple pregnancies, I just want to stress how important accuracy in our measurements really are. And we need to be able to pick up any small changes in the growth trends and velocity and any increasing difference between the fetuses, as this can be even more critical with mono dye and mono mono, obviously. Um, so for this first slide, I've only included the AC measurements for twin A for my example. Um, and essentially, it was reported as a normal size and growth and a, a normal difference with its twin at 12%. And a two-week follow-up was recommended. And this is our two-week follow-up. Again, only the twin AAC is included. Again, this is how they plotted. No concerns, normal growth, and consistent difference between the twins at 13%. So two-week follow-up again was was done. And here I've included all four measurements for twin A. And if you look closely at each one of these measurements, they all look to be slightly overmeasured for the reasons I mentioned earlier in my talk. Um, you can see that the, uh, we have too much of that umbilical vein in our abdomen and the oblique tips are included in the femur and our BPD measurements are slightly off. Um, and looking at this graph here on the right, both fetuses look to have increased in their measured growth trends. And while it's normal to have variations between positioning and operators, um, in assessing biometry techniques, these particular measurements led to a, a larger estimated fetal weight for twin A, um, as I mentioned earlier, leading to twin A plotting larger than it truly was. And while there can be accelerations or outliers in measurements, I just wanna point out how biometry measurement accuracy is just as important as assessing other areas of anatomy, especially in the serial growth assessments for twins. 
Um, so this scan was reported as normal growth and a slight increase in difference to 20% between the twins and another two week follow up was recommended. So two weeks later, with twin A having more accurate measurements this time, there looks to have been minimal growth, which is no surprise. Um, this decrease in growth velocity was documented along with a now 30 millimeter difference between AC measurements and a sustained 19% difference between fetuses. Um, so this time it triggered a Doppler assessment and it was reported as abnormal. A hospital admission was advised along with a course of steroids and daily NSTs. And this is how they were plotting. I believe twin A had been trending down and we could have caught this trend sooner with more accurate biometry and, and serial assessments. So we saw this patient in hospital a few days later uh, to monitor with BPPs and NSTs and she received a course of steroids and we completed another measurement at one week. Um, so essentially there was no change to the AC uh, measures at that third to fifth percentile with a 53 millimeter difference in AC measurements and a 30% growth discordance. Um, at, there were abnormal Dopplers again with intermittent absent and diastolic flow and severe placental insufficiency. So the patient was sent for delivery planning. Um, again, the reason I wanted to include this case was to demonstrate that fetal growth velocities can change very abruptly and quickly, and we need to be able to catch and diagnose them as early as possible using accurate and consistent biometry. So in conclusion, I just want everyone to make each measurement as accurate as possible for increasing that accuracy in the estimated fetal weights and following growth patterns really focus on image quality, the magnification, positioning, and measurement placements. Don't try to make measurements bigger, longer, or fit previous measurements or known gestational age. Um, use the appropriate growth charts to assess any significant changes in growth patterns, curves, or estimated fetal weights. And it's just important to have the accuracy and consistency between operators and sites. So in turn, we're able to offer the best care and management for better maternal and neonatal outcomes. It really makes a difference. There's my references. Thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, Monica, so much um, and great images. A uh, couple of questions that we have from the audience. Uh, first one is about the use of um, calipers versus the ellipse, uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I personally don't use the calipers um, in, in our practice. Um, but I know that it is, it does fall under the guidelines and as long as they're accurately placed, but I, I haven't done a back-to-back -back comparison of the, the two techniques um, as we always use the ellipse, as long as it's very accurately placed. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, this is just more of a comment from me, um, but I, you know, I don't think it it's, makes such a difference when you're, you know, especially potentially delivering a premature baby um, uh, about the importance of the vigilance to these measurements. And I think your point of showing how just su subtle changes of not really, you know, being true to your uh, biometry standards could make a, quite a significant difference in a fetal weight. And that could be the difference um, in delivering a baby or not. So like that, this is important. But um, I have, uh, we do have MFMs on the line. Dr. Um, uh, Chandra is here, Dr. Chu has joined us, and Dr. Obi is there as well because there's a, and, or you could answer, question is, uh, what is the appropriate interval between serial growth measurements? TT taking that one. Oh, definitely. Um, the, <laughs> the ideal um, interval should be two weeks. So if we're measuring, uh, trying to see a serial growth assessment, it should be two weeks. In Calgary, we do often do one week for a variety of reasons, but the ideal is two weeks for growth, serial growth. 
Yeah, and that's more like for fetal well-being. I think, yes, you but, know, you really can't interpret it such a short um, yes. interval that the variability is uh, and range of error is going to be. Um, Cheryl and and uh, Sue, what are your uh, what's your Edmonton perspective? I also agree. Two weeks. Um, I think we do have a little bit of a leeway when it comes to the more um, fine tuning of things. So extreme uh, preterm side of things. So we talked about maybe as early as one week, but with a caveat, knowing that these are special circumstances. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's some questions about COVID and we'll start an entire, this is going to be our like end of the day fisticuffs uh, with uh, COVID. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, the local guidelines in Alberta for fetal ultrasound with COVID have suggested to do an ultrasound post COVID infection approximately two to four weeks after an infection uh, and to do a third trimester growth assessment. Um, I think the bleed they say 28 weeks and then 36 ish weeks. Um, you know, there is no good studies on ultrasound surveillance. Some of this is based on a theoretical medical concern about placental differences with COVID infections, but truthfully, best available data does not see any increased risk in growth restriction or stillbirth, and we're not seeing neonatal uh, women in infecting with pregnancy with adverse birth or uh, growth issues for babies after birth. The caveat being is that if we have a mom who is very ill, um, you know, with pneumonia, respiratory failure, et cetera, that's a different circumstance. But for the mild uh, recovered cases of COVID, um, you know, there are guidelines there, but recognizing that, um, you know, uh, this is more out of uh, recommendations out of an abundance of caution. And I routinely, I mean, I think we've discussed earlier about, you know, what is potentially the role of a third trimester ultrasound for growth. And I think that's um, um, really, we, we have to keep, yeah, working on that and looking at that as, as a potential. And so I don't have a problem with it, but I, I do want to, to bring home the message not to scare women who've had mild COVID for which they've recovered to reassure them that we have good outcomes. I don't know if there's any comments from the gallery. No, I agree. I agree. Okay. The important thing is not to scare them. You're right. But um, doing the doing the imaging um, one or two times might not do any harm because it could also give us long term data retrospectively. Uh, but but that's, a, that's a study then. See, here's yeah. my yeah. And to but me, it's important not to scare the woman. I agree. Yeah. And we all I think every ultrasound, we have to think, why are we doing it? Right. It's a it's an indicated study. And yeah, I mean, ultrasound is safe. Um, but every every time we do an investigation, you know, there are potential um, harms in terms of false positives, for example, or, you know, uh, we talked earlier about having a woman having to drive to an ultrasound, find childcare, et cetera. So I think it is always good for us um, as uh, MFMs and sonographers is to really say, is this an indicated ultrasound? Um, yeah, just overall using healthcare um, resources. But that's another uh, argument for another time. And now we're going to move on to our next speaker. So thank you so much, Monica. My pleasure.